Now let's look at verse 6. So here's the mystery. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body. So notice that the mystery Paul explains here is verse 6. Gentiles become heirs, but not just heirs, fellow heirs. What does that mean? They're joining. They become fellow joint heirs with somebody and of the same body. They join this body. That's why it says same body. With who? Why? It's obvious, as I've taught you in the previous Ephesian studies, it's with the Jews. Remember that? So remember, if you read your Bible, and as you may have recalled in your previous Ephesian studies, the Jews were the ones who received the preaching first. Jesus said that the preaching would go to the Jews first, and that's found at Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. And then also if you look at Romans chapter 1, verse 16, these are two passages, Acts 1, 7 through 9, and Romans 1, 16, that mentions about that the preaching of Jesus Christ first went toward Jews, and then it went toward the Gentiles. So think about this. This debunks the hyper-dispensationalist teaching. You might say, how so? So remember, the hyper-dispensationalists, they keep having an infatuation, and uh, they have this infatuation that basically any writing that you see that a Christian can claim for himself that it's, no, it's all for the Jew. It's all for the Jew. It's all for the Jew. It's not for Christian. It's not for Christian. They want to separate Jew and the Christian church no matter what. Remember the heretical teaching is that we believe, we all know this, okay? We believe that the body of Jesus Christ, that it, uh, it started at Acts 2, well, technically it started at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and then fully in operation at Acts 2. But these hyper-dispensationalists, remember, they teach this weird heresy where some of them debate about, no, it started at the middle of Acts or at the end of Acts or somewhere all the way at the book of Ephesians. That's when the body of Jesus Christ started. Now, that's just weird. <laughs> But the reason why they teach that is because of the Jews. The Gentiles have no picture. Paul's ministry didn't start yet until the middle of Acts, or his ministry, Paul's ministry didn't start full swing until the book of Ephesians. So because they're so infatuated with Paul and anything that's separated from a Jew, that's why they jump the body of Christ that far. So remember that. So, no, we deny that because... Notice that we're saying that even though that Paul's ministry, yes, it started at the middle or his ministry toward Gentiles was not until much later in the book of Acts, that the body of Christ was still in operation before Paul. It doesn't, it doesn't have to start with Paul. That's what hypers are infatuated with. Hypers keep saying body of Christ, remember their teaching, body of Christ did not start until Paul's ministry. That's their logic. That's their rationale. They have to stick it toward there. Most hypers teach that. But we teach, no, the body of Christ started long before Paul, obviously. So that's pretty obvious. When did it, the body of Christ start? I'll tell you when it started, when Jesus died on the cross, when he gave salvation to mankind. It's that simple. But they said, no, 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 until later on at the book of Ephesians. So we say, no, it started when Jesus died on the cross before Paul. They say, no, it was only Jews, so that the Jews have their own body. So they make like two different bodies. The Jews have their own body, and then Paul, when he started his ministry, that's when the, we get the, our body of Christ, the second body. Note, if you read verse 6, these Gentiles, look at that verse, these Gentiles that Paul was preaching to joined the Jews in the same body. There goes, there debunks hyper-dispensationalism. And one of them, I could be wrong, but one of them, if I recall, who's probably the most, uh, who's probably the pastor with the most numerous subscribers on YouTube, says, Ephesians is my favorite book in the Bible, and then he denies that teaching. Well, hey, guess what? Ephesians debunks those hyper-dispensationalists. If that's their favorite epistle, they didn't study it well enough. The, the epistle, believe it or not, the epistle 
that some hyperdispensationalists consider as their favorite is actually the book of Ephesians, which turns out to be the number one epistle, perhaps, to debunk hyperdispensationalism. Think about it, church. Do you recall me debunking hyperdispensationalism this intensely compared to other teachings that I did before? So hyperdispensationalism, I didn't mention them so much until this book of Ephesians, didn't I? I mentioned them a few times, but not as so much until now. Why? Because Ephesians is all over debunking them. They don't really read. Okay, so be careful of this heresy. So what is hyper-dispensationalism? What kind of churches are they? Again, they're known as mid-axe church. They're also known as, they use the terms grace church or Berean church. Not, now, not every church that takes the name Berean or grace is a hyper-dispensationalist, but if you see that term, then you might want to look up their doctrinal creed, and then you'll find out quickly that they're hyper-dispensationalists. Basically, they teach the body of Christ did not start until the middle of the book of Acts. That's why they're called mid-Acts. Does that make sense? All right. Now, let's keep reading. The latter part of verse 6, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. These Gentiles partake in the same promise that the Jews have to be in Jesus Christ. See his body. See, the Jews are not at a separate body. And it's done by the gospel. When you receive the gospel that Paul preached, death, burial, resurrection of Christ, and you join in the same body of Christ. Now let's look at verse 7. Whereof I was made a minister. So Paul, he was made a minister of this gospel that we all hear about today. Do you believe that Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected? You repent as a sinner, trust in that for your salvation. Hey, you're saved. So by doing that, we become part of the same body of Christ. According to the gift of the grace of God, give it unto me. So notice that when Paul received this mystery, it was a gift given to him. And it is only by God's grace. That is mighty grace that out of everybody, God would give it to Paul. Yeah. So that was a gift given to him by the effectual working of his power. Now, this is very important. So this, it says by the effectual working of his power, which means then that the apostle Paul, when he received this teaching, this Pauline doctrine and his ministry, it is proven effectually there's a working of god's power that approves his ministry now do you know why you need to know that because there's a bunch of heretics out there go to second peter 3 second peter 3 and go to acts 15 second peter 3 and acts 15 there's a group of heretics that's starting to spurt out on youtube who hate dispensationalism so much. And the core reason why they hate the doctrine of dispensationalism is because of Paul. So then they have to discredit Paul. So then they say Paul was not a legitimate apostle. So that's the teaching that's rising out. But no, Paul had the approval by who? God himself. God himself, up in the throne of glory, blessed him with the effectual working of his power. So Paul received the power, and God's power through Paul's ministry, signs, wonder, and the everything, proved that Paul's ministry is legit. Look at 2 Peter 3. Notice that the chief apostle of Christianity approved of Paul's ministry. 2 Peter chapter 3. And then we'll look at verse 15. An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Look at that. So Peter recognized the wisdom Paul received is actually legit, and that God has given him that wisdom. Now look at this. This is very good. Use this verse, verse 16, on the people who hate Paul's ministry based on dispensational doctrine. Verse 16, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them 
of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. That applies to people who hate Paul's ministry. Use that verse on them. This verse is a good verse to tackle those who hate Paul's ministry. These people are people who are unlearned, they don't know Bible, and they twist the scriptures. Amen. So beware of those videos on YouTube, yeah. those teachers that you might come across on the streets or in the pulpits. Yeah. Let's look at Acts 15. Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. Dispensationalism is such clear as day, so the only way you can tackle dispensationalism is Paul. So see, that proves that dispensationalism is a true doctrine, that not all the verses harmonize with each other. There are verses that contradict each other, so they have to be divided to the right group and the right time period. That's what dispensationalism is. So dispensationalism, for some of you who don't know, which I recommend to watch Amazing Dispensational Truth from Genesis to Revelation, briefly, is that not all verses in the Bible apply to you. Not all doctrines in the Bible apply to you. They apply to different people at different time periods that occurred throughout history. That is important to understand. So such a, a clear, easy example is, if you don't keep the Sabbath day, then you're stoned to death. Do Christian churches uh, practice that? Obviously not, or we're all dead people. <laughs> How many of you work on Saturdays? Don't raise your hands. Somebody might have to stone you to death then. <laughs> so remember, uh, it, it changed when the Apostle Paul said, Sabbaths are not to be observed. No wonder Jews hated Paul, see? They hated him so much. So Paul's ministry definitely made a division. Why? Because God had different doctrines for different groups of people, different time periods. The Old Testament is called Old Testament. That's an older time period. We're under the New Testament now. It's very clear. Now, understanding that fact, look at Acts chapter 15. Notice at verse 22, Then it pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch, with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas surnamed Barsabas, and Silas chief men among the brethren, and they wrote letters by them after this manner. So notice over here that they, the whole church and apostles and elders approved Paul and Barnabas, but it's even more clear when we look at verse 25. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded, hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at that. They approved of these men. Yeah. So the entire New Testament church approved of the Apostle Paul's ministry. Now let's go back to Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3. Who's some guy to tell you what to, what to do 2,000 years later, what the apostles and Jesus really believed and approved of? Who are they to say? The apostles themselves debunked those guys. The apostles themselves, during that time, in Paul's lifetime, they said, hey, we approve of Paul's ministry. So Paul's a legit minister. 